Now, as I said, it's reciprocal, meaning this is this thing can go two ways. It's not just fats that are kind of beating down glucose with a club. Now, glucose can too. Sometimes glucose holds the club and, and it's the one in charge. So now let's sort of flip this coin and talk about how glucose utilization can inhibit fatty acid oxidation. So when we have high levels of glucose, it will increase glycolysis and increase pyruvate. When we continue with this, Increased glycolysis will end up resulting in the increase of another CoA molecule, this time not acetyl-CoA, but a molecule called malonyl-CoA. Now, there's still the CoA that they have in common, but they're different molecules. In fact, malonyl-CoA is made from acetyl-CoA. So when you continue to burn a lot of glucose, you start getting more and more malonyl-CoA. And then malonyl-CoA actually goes right to the mitochondria and shuts down the enzymes an enzyme complex called CPT1, which is necessary for the mitochondria to pull fats in. So fats need to be burned in the mitochondria, whereas glucose have both an external mitochondrial burning and an internal mitochondrial burning. And PDH is the kind of intermediate, that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex that I mentioned earlier. That's how the glucose progresses from burning outside the mitochondria then finishes all of its burning in Mal, uh, CPT1 is how the fats get burned at all. There's no, if you can't get a fat into the mitochondria, it's not burning. And so when, the, when you have a lot of glycolysis, you start producing a lot of malonyl CoA and then malonyl CoA shuts down that entrance enzyme. So now the fats can't get into the mitochondria to be burned. And that's it. That's the one point really of regulation. So it's a little more simple, um, than the, reciprocal regulation that I outlined earlier, where with fatty acid oxidation, it's regulating glucose burning at a couple different points. Glucose burning is now inhibiting fat burning at only that one point. It's inhibiting CPT1 and it works because fats have that one singular kind of entrance. There's, it's not as complicated. There, nothing happens really until it can get into the mitochondria. Okay. Now, as outlined in Randall's experiments, and the only thing people ever talk about is what I've just talked about, albeit perhaps with a little less detail, but the principle is still there and it's accurate the way I've heard it described in general social media circles. More fats results in less glucose burning. More glucose results in less fat burning. Even at that superficial level, it's helpful. It's important. Even then, you can start to see why I don't like the old adage of you are what you eat. I prefer this more accurate adage of you burn what you eat. If you're eating more glucose, no surprise, you're burning more glucose. If you're eating more fat in the absence of glucose, of course, I mean, then you're burning more fat. And the Randall cycle kind of makes some sense of that. However, it's not that simple. And even Randall himself and his colleagues, colleagues never suggested it was that simple. So where people stop there, they have done a misservice, um, a disservice, not only to anyone who's listening to them, but even to Dr. Randall and his colleagues, because they went a little further and looked at the role of hormones. Now, before I get into that, imagine a situation where both substrates are high, both calorie sources are elevated. Imagine a situation where the person has both high glucose levels and high free fatty acids. How does the cell know what to do? Does it look at both and just sort of give up and say, I'm helpless? I can't choose between the two of you lovely substrates. I don't know who to give the rose to in, uh, to burn. How does it decide what happens then if both are elevated? The answer is in endocrinology. There is a little known hormone that ends up telling the cell. If we look at the whole body level, and Dr. Randall included this in his work, we need to remember that if we go beyond the experimental model, which in this case was isolated perfused hearts, and look at the whole organism or the whole body, the cells aren't acting in isolation. How does one cell know what's going on with the rest of the body? How is a signal conveyed to it from the rest of the body? It's hormones that allow different parts of the body to talk with other parts of the body. Can you guess which hormone influences the use of the energy sources? The Randall cycle in the original experiments in the mid-60s looked at insulin and found that insulin had a tremendous role on dictating which energy source was used. It plays a critical role. It's not the only one, 
but it is extraordinarily important. And I would say it's the most important. So with insulin, we have the promotion of glucose utilization. Insulin does not want to burn fat, to, to put it in a, in a bit of a silly way, as if insulin has some desire. Insulin, its actions um, coordinate to prevent the body from burning fat. It wants the body to use glucose as a fuel. It does so when it docks to its insulin receptor on a cell, all of its biochemistry at that cell is going to be, well, there's so much that happens. Insulin does so much. Much of it, the metabolically focused aspect of insulin, the nutrient focused aspect of insulin is going to promote the use of glucose. Now, if it is tissues that need insulin for glucose uptake, it will ultimately open those glucose transporters called GLUT4. If a tissue has GLUT4, the glucose transporter number four, then it needs insulin generally in order to act. That's tissues like muscle and fat. And that matters a lot because most of what we're made of is muscle and fat for the average individual. For almost everyone, it's muscle, except for the profoundly obese. And in that case, of course, it's fat. But even in the average individual now, it's still generally muscle and fat mass constitutes the majority of their mass. And they're insulin dependent for glucose. Um, so they need insulin in order to open those, glu those glucose transport doors, the GLUT4 doors. So insulin does that directly. But even in tissues that don't have GLUT4, like the liver, the liver doesn't need insulin to tell it to take in glucose, but it still needs insulin to tell it what to do with the energy. Every single cell of the body will follow that pattern. Even if insulin isn't directly controlling the, the direct movement of the nutrient in, like glucose, it's still directly controlling what the cell does with the energy, including the Randall cycle. 